Hi, good evening, everybody. I just want to say a warm welcome to everyone who is on site, as well as our um, audience that's online. We have about 200 people who have signed up earlier today. So welcome, everybody, to the Head Foundation's Dialogues. Um, for those who may be knowing us for the first time, maybe I just give some um, intro. And the Hate Foundation we are established since um, 2013, and we aim to improve the lives of people in Asia by disseminating knowledge and sharing ideas and supporting and funding sustainable education and healthcare projects that develop social and human capital. So really our vision is to provide quality education and healthcare to improve lives in Asia. And so the dialogues that we organize you know, happens about once a month. Um, it's a really a series for thought leaders to come and share um, information, share their ideas and perspective on different issues. And so today we are very privileged to have two um, doctors coming here to share their ideas and perspectives um, on bringing primary health care for all and how we can bridge the gaps and uh, the power of networks in doing so. So um, I think for many of us, um, primary health care is probably the first doctors that we see when you have a chill, you have a, you know, you have a headache. These are the doctors that you see in the, um, for, um, these are the first doctors that we will see. And so um, the World Health Organization actually defines primary health care, right? as a whole of society approach to health that aims at ensuring the highest possible level of health and well-being and their equitable distribution by focusing on people's needs and as early as possible in the continuum. So as much as um, we want a very ideal um, primary health care system, oftentimes it's not the case in reality. And so today we have two doctors uh, who will come and share with us how they're making a difference in this, in this space. Um, so let me introduce to you our two speakers, uh, Dr. Go Sui King, who is the CEO of Angsana Health, and Dr. Go Wei Liang, who is the co-founder of HealthServe. May I invite first um, Dr. Ko, who will come up and share with us, um, give us a big picture of what primary health care is, its importance, and what has been done, in his opinion, um, what needs to be done more. Um, Dr. Ko is a Malaysian physician that specializes in health systems and the global health. He's based in Singapore today. Uh, he's been in many different countries, as he was sharing with us earlier today. Um, Hong Kong, um, you know, um, different parts of Europe, I think. And um, he's uh, also a visiting assistant professor at the Saul Sui Hock School of Public Health, Nation NUS. Um, and he's a member of the Health White Paper Advisory Council to the Malaysian Health Ministry and the co-chair of a Lancet Commission on Preparedness for Emerging the infectious diseases um, and he's you know also has um, published many papers and so I think he's in a very good position to share with us his thoughts on this area and so I'd like to welcome Dr. Kaur please. Okay. Um, so hello to our friends in the webinar as well and hello to our friends in the room we've got about 20 people in the room today and thank you to the Head Foundation for uh, organizing this event and inviting Dr. Gore and I to speak with you and have a conversation with you about primary health care um, this slide is my disclosure slide. Let me get that out of the way first, okay? So the disclosure is that uh, I'm from Malaysia, currently living in Singapore. We're building a company, my friends and I are building a company called Angsana Health, and we're trying to build a digital primary healthcare company. So I'll tell you a little bit more about primary healthcare um, and why we chose that as uh, the, the, the mission for ourselves. Uh, professionally, my career, I've had three careers to introduce myself, is to say that uh, five years as a medical doctor, uh, in which I specialized in medicine, and then eight years in pharma. This was when I was based in several countries, including in Singapore about 10 years ago. And the last four years, I've been doing health systems and global health, especially during the time of COVID. Uh, the, I, I guess my friends and I and colleagues and I in health systems and global health were being quite high demand also. Lah. Uh, this was during COVID. Um, I have masters in medicine in public health and public policy. So this is a bit about me. Let me, let me go on to the next slide, please. Sorry, Nazira. Thanks. Just don't have the clicker with me. Um, I only have two slides, you know, so it's not really a, a presentation. So slides are very, slides are great. We love slides, uh, but I think it's good for us to have a conversation too. So any questions that you have, they are not medical, okay? So this is not a forum to give medical advice. So for best medical advice, go see the primary care doctor. Let me start with some definitions. What I'd like to do is uh, I will uh, give some color commentary uh, after you finish reading the slide. So if you don't mind, can I pause here for one minute? You finish reading and then you just sort of look at me and give me a small thumbs up, then I know that you're done, okay? So for our friends in the webinar, uh, we will pause for one minute while you can view the slides and read the slides uh, yourself first, then I'll provide some color commentary. Thank you.
So mostly done. So before the uh, after tonight's session, right? For for after I finish speaking, hopefully for the next uh, five seven minutes or so after this slide, you all can go back and be an expert in three things already. Then you can tell your neighbors, you can tell your friends, uh, be an expert in three things. The first one, what is primary healthcare? Secondly, health for all, and thirdly, universal health coverage. So we talk firstly about primary healthcare, okay? So what Xiao Ching has provided just now is a the WHO definition of what's primary healthcare a whole of society approach to health that aims at whole speech there, okay? So that's the WHO definition. Uh, it's a very long definition. So the easy definition for primary healthcare is anything outside a hospital is primary healthcare. Anything outside a specialist is also primary healthcare. Now, specialists are great. Huh? I love specialists and I'm a specialist myself. The, the thing about primary healthcare is that they're as great as specialists. You cannot say that specialist is better than primary healthcare. You also cannot say that primary healthcare is better than specialist. Both are equally great and equally important. Therefore, the definition of primary healthcare is easy. Anything outside hospitals, considered primary. Anything outside specialists can be considered primary healthcare, which means that primary healthcare is very broad. Polyclinics, uh, Sing Health Polyclinics or the GPs that you see uh, in, in, in Singapore, primary healthcare. Home-based services, like the nurse or the doctor goes to your home, primary healthcare. Digital health in your pocket, on your smartphone, smartphone apps, primary healthcare as well. All that, uh, if you take it outside of the physical hospital, can be considered primary healthcare. So what's primary healthcare? Outside hospital, outside specialist. Therefore, you can see it's very broad. So that's the first definition, so that we can converse and, and have a conversation about what is primary healthcare by understanding that anything outside hospital, outside specialist is primary healthcare. Now, that's the second definition health for all. Um, there is a difference between health care and health. This is the difference. Health care is you go to a clinic or a hospital to see a doctor or a nurse to get surgery or vaccinations. That is health care. I'm caring for you when you are usually sick. Lah. Then, then when you're sick, then not you, but when somebody is sick, then the person will receive health care. But health, if you look at the third Thing at the bottom here that says social, not just scientific, health is much bigger than healthcare. Healthcare is hospitals and clinics, doctors and nurses, surgeries and medicines. But health is labor rights. And, and I think uh, Dr. Gore later will speak about the rights of migrants in any country, not just Singapore. Malaysia has got a lot of migrants. We have to care for migrants. If we care for migrants and when they are healthy, then we will be healthy as well, infectious diseases and so on. And here's another example of labor rights, which is not healthcare. So healthcare is hospitals and clinics, doctors and nurses. But labor rights meaning if I'm not well, then I can take MC. And if I have COVID, I get to stay at home. If labor rights don't give you holidays that you can stay at home, then you're forced to come to the office. When you come to the office, then you infect everybody with COVID. That's an example of labor rights. Clean water, clean air, housing rights, migrant rights, gender equality, all of that is outside the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health in Singapore is not responsible for clean air. Who's responsible? NPARCs, NEA, uh, PUB, uh, and all other Singapore government agencies and acronyms. So I'm still getting to know Singapore. So many other agencies in Singapore are responsible for health, not just Ministry of Health. Another example would be housing rights, or oh, that's HDB, for example, uh, in, in, involved in, in uh, housing rights uh, for Singaporeans. And in other countries, there'll be other agencies that are not MOH in charge of social determinants of health, not just the scientific determinants of health. So health for all is not health care for all, it's health for all. So it must also encompass the first one, promotive and preventive. Stop people from getting sick instead of only treating them when they're sick. To be more controversial, every country in the world, right, is actually not Ministry of Health, you know, what they're Ministry of Sick Care. When you're sick, I take care of you in the hospital. To have a true Ministry of Health, you must do a lot of promotion and preventive work. To have a true, and here's a fun, uh, some, some fun facts as well. Malaysia is Ministry of Health, Singapore's Ministry of Health, Thailand is Ministry of Public Health, Korea, Ministry of Health and Family, Japan, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. So these are interesting models in other countries that they on, don't only focus on healthcare or sick care or health, but they look at family, welfare and other parts of healthcare and the health system as well. So health for all uh, must be promotive and preventive, must be in clinics and in homes and in pockets, not just in hospitals, and must also be social, cannot only be scientific. 
The third definition, right, is universal health coverage. Now, at the bottom over here um, is a term, or rather on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, uh, for those in the webinar, UHC, or universal health coverage, is, uh, the, the, that's a definition, all people have access to the full range of quality healthcare services that they need, when and where they need them, without financial hardship. Sorry, I don't memorize that. I just repeat what's on the screen, lah, because I copy and paste. An easy way to remember what's universal health coverage when your friends are asking you, really, you can go back and tell your friends, what is UHC? You get the healthcare that you need whenever you need it without going bankrupt. That's it. You get the healthcare that you need whenever you need it without going bankrupt. All these three things are important. You get the healthcare that you need because if you don't need the healthcare, you don't take the healthcare. Because if you don't need the healthcare, you go take the healthcare, the cost will go up for everyone. So not good when you need it so that you don't wait too long. And that's why primary care is important because there's so, the 1,700 something clinics in Singapore, but only a few hospitals. I mean, not 1,700 hospitals is my point. Malaysia has about 10,000 clinics and only about uh, 300 hospitals, plus minus. So the number of clinics makes it easy for you to get the healthcare that you need whenever you need it. Thirdly, without going bankrupt. Um, an unfortunate statistic for Malaysia is that uh, 20, okay, 100 people go bankrupt in Malaysia, right? Example. So 100 people go bankrupt, 20 of them go bankrupt because of medical bills. That's a high number, unacceptable. You can go bankrupt if your business fails, maybe, and that's an acceptable, I guess, risk. But people should not go bankrupt based on healthcare risks. Or my medical bills go up, that's why I go bankrupt. So universal health coverage is a World Health Organization goal. You get the healthcare that you need whenever you need it without going bankrupt. This is it. These are the three definitions. Primary care, easy. Outside hospital, outside specialist. Health for all, not only curative, but also preventive and promotive. Also social, not just scientific. Universal health coverage, healthcare that you need whenever you need it without going bankrupt. Okay, I'm gonna happy to move on to my second slide right now and the final slide. Thank you, Nazira. Um, in this slide, um, the first part of the slide says, why is it primary healthcare important? Or PHC, primary healthcare, why is it important? In the second part, what are the challenges? What are the gaps? And thirdly, how to try to fix those gaps? Uh, again, I'll pause here for about a minute for uh, our friends uh, to, to maybe quickly read the slide. And for our friends in the webinar, uh, we're also going to pause for one minute while I'll stop talking and we can read the web uh, we can read the slide together. Okay, so we start with why is primary healthcare important, okay? Here's another fun thing that you can tell your friends and your family members. Uh, okay, I was going to ask who owns a car. I think in Singapore, not many people own a car, right? Because of COE. Um, but let's assume we own a car and you want to go to a mechanic because we're going to fix the car, right? You will look for a mechanic that's good, fast and cheap, right? Everything that we want to purchase must be good, must be fast, must be cheap. Healthcare is the same good, fast, and cheap, but there are different terms in healthcare. So I've given terms uh, that are the three E's and the QAC. The three E's are efficient, effective, and equitable. This is on the, the right-hand side of the screen in blue. Yeah. Um, so efficient is cost, effective is quality, and equitable is access, which is basically good, fast, and cheap, or, or rather cheap, uh, good, and fast. Good, fast, and cheap, 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 good, and fast, same thing. Lah. The point being that the, the uh, thinking process that we usually have, like uh, you want to renovate your house, you want to find a mechanic for your car, you want to buy a coffee, you always, we as consumers, almost always look for good, fast, and cheap. Healthcare is exactly the same. Primary healthcare is the best chance for us to achieve good and fast and cheap. Because usually when you go to a mechanic, right, uh, to fix a car or a motorcycle, we usually have this problem where we think good and fast, not cheap, fast and cheap, not good, right? So what can you really do in healthcare to try to achieve three things at the same time? Quality, excess cost, good, fast, cheap, and efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. The answer is probably primary healthcare. 
So not just me who says this, World Health Organization says this, the American Academy of Family Physicians says this, and many research papers are saying this as well. So this is not an SK opinion. This is a, a evidence-based opinion and policies by various entities. So, I mean, frankly, who cares what I think? It's more what does the research and what does the data show us? So primary healthcare is important because it's good, fast, and cheap. Let's talk about the cheap part first, okay? Or affordable, if you don't prefer the word cheap. It can be cheaper often than hospital care. And if you prevent diseases from taking place in the first place, then you'll be saving a lot of money as well. That's how primary healthcare can be very cost effective or affordable. Prevention is usually, prevention of diseases, right, is usually left to primary care systems, not at hospital care. Hospital care is heroic life saving, generally speaking. Primary care is prevent diseases from happening in the first place. So that's why primary healthcare can be efficient and affordable. Secondly, it can be very effective because in many countries, uh, and Singapore's going in that direction as well, and so, so is Malaysia, although lagging a bit behind, is to move towards a one family, one doctor approach from womb to tomb, meaning from birth all the way to, well, the end of life, it's the same doctor. I know who you are. If I know you from start to finish, then it's easier for me to give you good care because there's familiarity. We trust each other. Uh, recommendations that a doctor provides to you is more easily taken up because we trust each other. And that's effective. Thirdly, because there are so many clinics uh, in a, a country, usually, more clinics it goes to faster access and that's why primary healthcare is important because it can be good fast and cheap let me go to the second component the second component is what are the gaps in primary healthcare now for all the talk about primary healthcare and primary healthcare being good and fast and cheap and effective efficient equitable high quality low cost and, and uh, high access there are gaps here are three gaps the first gap is there is low funding for primary healthcare OECD is an uh, organization for economic cooperation and development. It's basically Europe and, and America, Japan, South Korea. It's a club of rich countries, approximately 28 or 30 rich countries in the OECD. The average OECD spending on primary healthcare is 14% of total healthcare budget, meaning out of $1,000 or $100 that you have in healthcare, total spending, the whole country, the whole year, $14 goes to primary. Therefore, $86 goes to hospitals. That's a lot. And, and, and that kind of disparity, I don't know what's the right number. Nobody will tell you what's the right number, but 14 and 86% seems to me to be quite disproportionate. Secondly, hospitals are very visible. When hospitals are so visible, there's a lot of money that goes there. And um, if you've uh, allocated, let, let's just say you've got four children, right? And then you're trying to give money to the four children, generally the child who screams the loudest gets the most. And hospitals scream a lot, very, very loudly. It happens in all countries, by the way, so it's not just a Malaysia problem, for example, but it happens in all countries. So hospitals, um, they'll say things like, I need uh, money to buy reagents, to do laboratory tests and so on. Whereas uh, inside clinics, they don't scream so loudly. They're not visible. When you're not visible, you don't get money. You don't get money, you cannot improve your services. That's the second gap, political visibility. And frankly, politicians like to cut ribbons for hospitals. They don't really like to cut ribbons for clinics because clinics are very small. But hospitals, 1,000 bits. I bring a big hospital to my constituency. Generally speaking, um, that's a very politically visible sign, especially in emerging and developing countries. Thirdly, um, perhaps society thinks a lot about specialists, as in specialists are great. And, and there's a lot of trust, actually, in primary care that we're not really tapping on. These are the gaps. Now, how to fix them? The intentions of fixing, to strengthen, to improve primary health care in any country, so this is not a Singapore description, every country is going through this uh, situation right now, is to increase three things, which is access, quality, reduce cost, and I'll give you a fourth component, which is user satisfaction. So it's not just good, fast, and cheap health care, it's good, fast, and cheap health care that you like. This is the four aims of a health system, good, fast, cheap, and you enjoy the service, it's a good user experience, and you feel very pleasant uh, while, using, while using the service. So I'm, I'm summarizing a health systems theory, right? Good, fast, cheap, and you enjoy using the service. That's the intention of primary healthcare. If that's the intention, then we strengthen primary healthcare in two ways, to increase funding, but also increase the political visibility. Really, I should put that as an important point as well. And specifically in the increasing funding part is to say that, uh, we probably need to find a way to build physician payment mechanisms. Now, how are doctors and nurses paid in, a, in several ways? One way is that you pay a salary. I pay you $10,000 a month and then you do uh, 40 hours a week. Salary fixed. 
The second way is the more procedures you do, you perform 10 surgeries, I, the more surgeries you do, for every surgery you do, I give you more money. Uh, the third way is pay for performance. Like if you do good surgery, I give you more money. If you do bad surgery, I give you less money. The fourth way is capitation, which is there are 20 people that you're taking care of. I give you $1,000 for every patient and the balance is your profit or the balance is your salary, for example. Now, each of those four ways, you pay a salary, you uh, do fee for service, you pay for performance or you capitate. There's no perfection. Uh, always got pros and cons and we must then work in the trade-offs. There's no perfect way to pay a health professional. My point over here is if you equalize primary care to hospital care and the doctors in primary care and hospitals get roughly the same amount of money, then you're increasing the stature, increasing the visibility, increasing the importance of primary care. And that's very important. And how do we strengthen primary health care? To increase the digital tools available to primary health care practitioners, general practitioners and family medicine specialists as well. This is the end of my presentation. So what I might say at the end of it, right, is to say that um, generally speaking, the, uh, the first slide has given you definitions to understand what is primary health care. Secondly, health for all. Thirdly, universal health coverage. To repeat briefly, uh, primary health care, outside hospital, outside specialists. For universal health coverage, you get the health care that you need whenever you need it without going bankrupt. That's the first slide. In this particular slide, we talked about why is primary health care important? Because it's good, fast, cheap. What are the gaps? Usually funding and political visibility. And how do we strengthen it? Well, we fix those two problems in an attempt to make primary healthcare good, fast, cheap, and one more, uh, pleasant to use, user satisfaction, easy to use and pleasant to use. Um, what I've tried to do is to summarize a very complex concepts and hopefully layperson language. And I invite questions from anyone later. Let me pause here with my gratitude to all of you. I'm going to pass the floor back to Xiao Ching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, I think you gave a really comprehensive view of what primary health care is when even if you don't know i think going out from here we all know what primary health care is where the gaps are why it's important and what we can do so moving on maybe let me invite um dr go to then share with us you know some of the work you know he has been working with the migrant workers and he's been working in different areas you know actually working with people who are underserved even in the primary health care area and i would like to have him share with us some of his stories what he's been doing um so just to give uh, his his uh, to introduce him, Doctor um, Doctor Go's life mission is to be a catalyst, um, bringing life. Um, he's a real coffee lover. Um, his passion is to serve the vulnerable. Let um, towards he, the his passion to serve the vulnerable led him to found Health Serve, an NGO serving foreign workers, and he was awarded the Singaporean of the Year 2017 for his work amongst the low wage migrant communities. He's currently serving as a family physician at his clinic in a low-income neighborhood and he sits on the board of National Volunteer and Philanthropy Center. So let's welcome Dr. Go to share with us more. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, I'm really glad to be here. And thanks, SK, for setting the stage. And I think uh, you have now educated all of us uh, really well. And I think then, you know, the stories I tell will make a lot more sense. So I'm Wei Leong, and uh, I am a primary care physician. And the area I serve is just a stone's throw. It's a 10 minute drive or 30 minute walk from uh, this place that we're in. And uh, I've been in this primary health care for the last uh, 30 over years. And one of the things that I really enjoy are all the patients that I see. And so this whole uh, thing of primary health care, so much talk about it. But today, I'm going to focus on two things, which is um, about the power of social networks, uh, both uh, informal and formal, as well as social capital uh, in primary healthcare in the context of Singapore. So for most of us who are in Singapore, you know that primary healthcare has been very developed. The systems are uh, very developed, the universal healthcare systems too, and it's always changing. And in the last few months, you may have heard uh, in the press and with uh, the health minister talking about healthier SG. And years before that, you have uh, the community health assist systems and all that. Uh, and so it's always evolving. And the latest development, as I mentioned, is this healthier SG initiative. And this is really in line about moving primary health care to the fore. In the past, maybe 20 years ago, a lot of emphasis was on specialist care, on hospitals, 
as SK mentioned. And there was there was a, a the time where the world was concentrating uh, concentrating on that. And now we're really talking about the importance of primary health care. And being a family physician, you know, I resonate with what uh, SK just said, and because I'm right in the midst of this whole ecosystem. So Singapore aims to move primary health care by act activating the primary health care physicians. So lots of uh, emphasis and money has been poured into the sector now. So trying to move health care from hospitals to the community. Secondly, they are developing plans, care plans to improve chronic health care, uh, sorry, chronic disease. So chronic disease like diabetes, hypertension, uh, high, high cholesterol, all these, right, we're trying to move into, de into developing healthcare plans for the patients. Apart from just digital medicine, how do we educate our patients? Then the third component is actually community partners. So medicine cannot be just done by doctors or nurses alone, but who else? We've got social workers, the entire spectrum of people have to come in. And so part of the strategy, uh, strategy then is to then provide structures that will facilitate all this that the government and Singapore wants to do. So what more can be done? Right? That's the questions uh, that we hope to answer. And we've done quite a lot in the past few years. So I'm going to bring you to stories that make some of these policies and movement come alive. Because really, at the end, it's about people, you and I, our patients, you and I, right? So let me just tell you about uh, Madam Lau. So Madam Lau is this elderly patient, and so I knew her for many years. And one day, I was in the clinic and I had a call from a social worker. She said, hey, Dr. Go, you know, could you come see Madam Lau? I said, what happened to her? Well, uh, she, she's now really living alone because her son who is providing for her has just died of a heart attack. So I said, okay, I'll come. At that time, I had two Filipino colleagues who was uh, visiting, and so I said, hey guys, would you like to come with me to do a house call? So they came along, and at the end of the house call, I say, hey Carl and Jenna, what do you think? She said, wow, Dr. Go, I think, uh, you know, primary health care in Singapore is pretty cool. Uh, you know, Madam Lau lives in a nice, clean, one-room, low-cost rental apartment provided for by the government at low cost. And you have got all the services, you know, we've got, it's clean, it's efficient, it's cheap, fast, accessible, right? everything. And plus, you know, we've got volunteers who come, Meals on Wheels, uh, there's a social worker who called me, I went to visit her, and, um, you know, and there's transport to bring her for hospital appointments. That's fantastic. Now, then the other guy said, uh, yeah, Dr. Go, we really think it's amazing, but, you know, but this will not happen in the Philippines, in my village, in my town. So I said, why? He said, well, Dr. Go, you know, Madam Lau would have been my grand, our grandmother. So I had a pause, I had a long pause. You see, Madam Lau would have been adopted by his family as grandma, instead of being left alone. So I think there are some, uh, so I pause and I realize that there's lots of stuff we can learn from people who think out of the box. So I think in Singapore first, I think I learned that uh, we have got access, we're privileged to have access to very good healthcare and, uh, and a whole plethora of community services. Lots of services, isn't it? The, the coordinated services with, uh, especially from the Agency of Integrated Care. But you know, these services truly provide us with lots of resources. And um, I think Singapore has done well to foster the uh, network of social services and all the agencies. They're all very coordinated. So there is a network, right? the power of a network, to support the marginalized communities, disadvantaged communities especially. And then, so this formal network of social services, right? it's a very formal network between the government agencies like SingHealth, uh, AIC, Agency for Integrated Care, and with the social services, all integrated, is really important in the whole primary care scene. Then the doctors of primary care doctors like myself are plugged in. I'm also part of a primary care network of some 50 doctors. And there are quite a few of these networks in Singapore. So it's all formal networks connected. So then we also realize from this story that actually, apart from this nicely coordinated formal networks. What do you need are family and community 
in the, in the Filipino ex experience, Carl, my, my friend from, uh, my colleague from Philippines said, well, you know, perhaps the X factor of she being loved as a fellow human is really important. Which really brings me to my next point about informal networks. So this is about formal networks, and now I'm talking about informal networks. So let me tell you about informal networks. So Madam Tan, another story. She's again been my patient for a long time. She's a cleaner. And um, so she had chest infection and uh, she was warded for three days for a chest infection. And so because of that, her pay was deduct uh, deducted by her employer and her stay in hospital was not paid for. And so she came to me to see me, you know, uh, a couple of weeks after that uh, for another uh, different problem. And she told me this whole story about her hospital stay. And I said, wow, how can that be, isn't it? Because not only, you know, uh, I denied your pay, but this is about justice also, isn't it? Working rights and all. Now, interestingly or providentially, the night before, which was, uh, she came to see me on Monday, but the day, the day before, I was at a dinner. I was seated next to a young lawyer whose mother worked in the workers' union, right? In the trades union. And he's a lawyer, mother is not. And we were talking about all this uh, worker rights and all. And um, so I called him, I said, don't worry, Madam Lau, let me call my friend. So I called him, I said, hey, could you help me with this? He said, I'm a young lawyer, I'm not so familiar, let me ask my mother, okay? So he, so I told Madam Lau, okay, I'll get back to you. Now, so I spoke to my friend and his mother advice, gave him all the detail, details of Madam Lau, her contact. A week later, Madam Lau pops in my clay and says, Hey, Dr. Dr. Go, thank you so much. You know, I don't know what happened. You know, my, my employer called me and then he paid for my bill and then the HR called me and uh, they've given me my back pay. I said, wow, fantastic. All right. So, you know, Madam Lau's story is so different, isn't it? It's a power about the power of informal networks. You know, I call my friend, this young friend, that I just a uh, young lawyer that I just met. He tells his mother, his mother calls her, all informal. There's no agency to help us with this. It's an informal network. And I think the point here is that all of us, you and I, we're always a part of this healthcare chain, isn't it? And I think being an advocate for those who sometimes are unable to do it for themselves is really important in the larger scheme of things. And I think all of us, again, you and I, are important in maintaining the integrity of this a network and in effective in effecting change. So if you ever come across someone uh, who needs help, well, please go check out your network. Okay, there's always something you could do, and uh, you can always be an advocate. So the concluding thought is this: everyone has a part to play in a network of care, both informal and formal, and this will then plug into the larger primary health care systems. So with that, I'll then open uh, to questions and the dialogue we have with SK. I think a lot more, and you can ask me more about how uh, this scene happens in the migrant healthcare scene also. So Sorry, thank so you, Dr. Goh, for your for the sharing that you've done um, on the stories. You know, it's really very intriguing how um, sometimes when although we have um, many, I guess, networks in place formally, yet people don't feel they are fully helped. But at the same time, when you have your informal networks of working people, actually people, um, you you actually being helped. But so with this, I want to open up to a time of question and answer. Um, anything that you might like to ask the two speakers over here. But for myself, maybe let me just kick off some in some of the questions that I had in my head, even as both of you were sharing. So let's take this informally. Um, have a little dialogue with our with our um, speakers right here. So um, if I may ask. Um, about actually the stories of your challenges of, I, I think both um, Dr. Ko and Dr. Go, you have in your own way, right, in your respective areas, been trying to push the envelope for primary health care, um, whether it's with the migrant workers or is it in your public policy, and I guess even with your new um, venture right now with Angsana Health. Um, 
what are I would like to ask, you know, what are the real challenges that you have faced in this when you're trying to do this? I think it's great to see, you know, all the networks, all the all the big ideas here. But I think on the ground, many times that's where the real challenges are being faced. I'd like to know, you know, what are these challenges and what um what did you do to actually overcome them? If I can invite you. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Xiao Xing. Um, mic check? Okay, got it. Thank you. The question is, what are the main challenges? There are many challenges. I'll just pick one uh, to get started and then maybe we can go back and forth as yeah. well. The, the question is, what is the challenge to strengthen primary health care? Fair enough? Okay. One challenge to strengthen primary health care um, is that the incentive systems in the whole uh, healthcare system, and I'm speaking about the whole world in general, by the way, so it's not focused on any one country, the incentive structures, financial incentive structures, uh, incentivize hospital care. Specialists in hospitals are paid a lot of money. They want to keep that high salaries that they have. Number two, uh, insurance companies generally reimburse for inpatient care, meaning hospital care, but not outpatient care. Thirdly, uh, there is this number of people uh, and, and companies that uh, sell a lot of very important medicines, technologies, surgeries, devices, and so on. They are often very expensive, and many of the customers belong in hospitals as well. Now, I'm not saying that these medicines are not important. Of course, they're very important. The point I'm making is that primary care is equally important. I'm not saying primary care is more important. Certainly, it's not less important. However, the disproportionate importance of hospital care and the incentive structures where people in hospitals are paid more and uh, um, there's an insurance system that rewards more inpatient rather than outpatient care makes it a bit difficult to strengthen primary care. How do you change all that is the second part of Xiao Jing's question. Um, there, there's this branch of uh, uh, economics called health economics. Health economics studies uses economic principles to look at how we're allocating money for healthcare. And health economics tells us that more money and more funding and more investments in primary care will reduce cost, increase access, increase quality, increase satisfaction, meaning good, fast, cheap, I mean more good, more fast, more cheap, and finally more user mm. satisfaction. Um, so the data is strong and, and the data, there's many, many papers out there and we can all look at the papers together. The, the solution to that is unfortunately requiring political solutions political solutions in the sense that there needs to be strong political will demonstrated, for example, by Singapore recently in Healthy SG. It's great strong political will to, we understand the problem, we understand why there's a problem, we're going to fix the problem. It's something I really admire Singapore's government for, find a problem, fix a problem, and, and you're good at, we are good at, I mean, sorry, Singapore is really good at that. The point I'm making is to solve the problem requires a lot of political will. Now, how to build that political will? Ah, country by country, situation of the country. We need patient groups to come in, doctors' associations to come in. We need civil societies and NGOs, uh, things like that, you know, to build that political will. That is a, a separate conversation because we must talk about the yeah. country specifics uh, of how to build that political will for better changes in primary health care. Let me pause here, maybe turn to what to go. Oh. Thanks, yes. I think along, uh, to just take off from where you just left off, in terms of political will, really is a culture shift, right? I think the whole society, we need everyone to be involved in the change of thinking, change of mindset. And I think over the years, uh, medical school training is another important point. Right? So most of our training for doctors and nurses is hospital-based. Mm. So when it's hospital-based, the doctors will come out, then they're always looking to a specialty. And family medicine, for example, or primary care is not seen as a specialty. And uh, so the training is a lot less in the past. Now, today, today's world, family medicine, for example, is a division by itself, a department, right? So a lot more emphasis. And so if that's the case, then we need more funding to be plowed into this area. And uh, the good news is really a lot more emphasis. And with all the government and political will, as you mentioned, now, uh, with Healthy SG, I think the next decade we'll see primary care come up. In the past, uh, there's so much emphasis on specialist care, which I think is very important. Singapore, for example, wanted to be a top cardiology center, neurosurgery, and all the top specialties for the region for good reason. But then came an expense because then, you know, the training was skewed towards that. And again, because the training and emphasis also on the super specialties, then funding went there. 
again more visible. All right. So now we are looking at a major cultural shift, shift of mindset from our new breed of doctors. And the other thing, the young doctors today, many of them are thinking, I like to be a family physician, I like to do public health. And if you ask them why, the millennials, they'll tell you, I want to change the world. So I think there's hope for us because there's a shift in the next generation. I am a boomer and I think boomers think differently, right? And I think it's also reflected in the generation. Yeah. So in the past, it's also a bit of this generation thing. So we're hearing um, really the political will and the funding comes into place a lot in trying to shift this, shift this um, focus onto primary health care a lot more. Yeah. So um, right now, maybe I can open up the question to the floor if anyone might want to ask some questions. I emailed MOH more than one year ago to Tam. Uh, then the, until now they replied. They all reply me AI, AI reply la, But until now they never answer. My last question is what? No, I say history has proven God has created the best nature healing environment, and the best nature healing body immune system, and the best nature healing honey fruits. Example. Blah, 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 versus man made experimental COVID 19 vaccine? Question mark. Then I come to uh, my conclusion. Uh, I do a research. Why prevention is always better than cure? Because a single spark can start a big fire without warning. So I, I find it very how to say, contradiction. Uh. I don't understand why the MOH. The vaccine maker don't no benefit for all you sign contract with Pfizer matter. Then cannot side effect. Then use our tax taxpayer to pay. The latest case is a Vietnam lady after jab four days passed away. Yeah. More than more one case, other country worse. Uh. Then uh the vaccine makers should take responsibility. Uh. You get what I mean? Uh. I, I want to check uh what is your uh personal opinion? What, what is Correct me, I'm wrong. Uh. It don't make sense. I don't understand why the MOA signed a contract with Pfizer. I only know the benefit. The, Thank you. The yeah. government get they build one. They're going to build one more than one vaccine factory. You know, it don't make sense. Why? 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 You Thank tax you. Pay Thank you. The vaccine Thank makers you. should take responsibility. Yeah. Thank then you for I your. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you, you for your question. I think uh, SK has a response. Uh, sure. I'll go first. Um, Mister. Liang, thank you, Mr. Liang. Call me SK. Mr. Liang, thank you for your question. Um, I don't agree with you, uh, is my short answer to that. Here's, here are the reasons why. Um, the, training for, uh, the, the training that I received and many doctors have received requires us to look at evidence. Now, um, to look for evidence philosophically uh, requires us to understand that there will never be perfect evidence. Therefore, every time we make a decision in our daily lives, we're examining something called trade-offs. We make the best possible decision with the best available data at that time. I hope you agree with me with this one, Ms. Liang. Secondly, is to say that vaccines, since the very first vaccine against the smallpox and polio, have reduced X num uh, have saved X number of lives and reduced Y number, Y amount of suffering. This is a this is a established fact. The same way as gravity speed of light, water is wet, vaccine saves lives. This is an established fact for many, many diseases, and it's not just COVID. So this is not an fa uh, established fact that I'm prepared to argue with anyone with because it is an established fact. Water is wet, sun rises in the east, vaccine saves lives. Thirdly, however, uh, and, and I see why you might be a little um, fearful, if I can use the word, about the COVID vaccine. This was in 2021, right, when we started rolling out a lot of COVID vaccines for ourselves. Now, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I, had, I had three times of the vaccines, uh, and I feel okay about that. The reason for the COVID vaccine uh, uncertainty was because sometimes people feel like we rushed the vaccine. That's not true, you know. The mRNA technology took 10 or 12 years in research, quietly, the scientists doing their work. And then suddenly, you know why we could uh, have that vaccine very quickly? Because suddenly, when the whole world was affected, and if I'm being completely honest with all of you, when rich countries were affected by COVID, yeah, when the rich countries are affected by COVID, they threw billions of dollars on it. With billions of dollars on 12 years of research, you can get a vaccine just like that. That's how you feel that the vaccine is fast. But no, the vaccine was in development for 12 years. Of course, there are side effects. There, are, there will be side effects inevitably to almost everything that we consume, like 
for example, I, I really like economy rice and I really like tokan, like uh, tofu, right? But um, even having a lot of tofu, at some point, it's going to be not good for me because of the preservatives and, and whatever else is inside the tofu. Standard thing. So the final point I'll make over here before turning on to Dr. Gore is to say that we look for trade-offs, meaning if it brings us more good than bad, we'll take that decision. At the time of COVID, people were dying left, right, center. The vaccines protected us, prevented X number of deaths, prevented X number of deaths. I don't, I don't know what's X. Uh, X is a lot. Millions of people uh, did not die because of the vaccine. And another set of millions of people had milder COVID because of the vaccine itself. I believe in vaccines is my full answer. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Yes, and in my own practice, uh, my patients, again, come from all walks of life. And all this was evident as I practice not just, uh, you know, it's all evidence-based. So, yes. So I agree absolutely with uh, okay. Casey. Thank you. Thank you for that yes. very, um, I think, comprehensive answer to explain. Oh, sorry, SK. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, maybe let's take a few questions from the our audience online. Um, I saw this, that's uh, for Dr. Go actually. Um, how can we strengthen healthcare for our migrant workers is what one of our one of our um, audience is asking and um, along with it, maybe just let me add this. She also mentioned that uh, another attendee mentioned that in the Philippines, medical missions are organized by politicians and outreach programs of hospitals, non-governmental organizations and medical societies. Do the associations on groups in Singapore also organize medical missions to indigenous uh, communities periodically? I think uh, um, perhaps that's something um, Dr. Goen is, um, Dr. Kaur can also respond. Yeah, maybe I'll take the first uh, question first. So, uh, primary health care for, primary care for the uh, um, migrant worker. So, yes, I think today the scene is very different from maybe 10 years ago. So, let me tell you how. So, let's uh, go back 10 years. So, in the past, uh, the Singapore public, they don't know that we have actually got migrant workers. They say, yeah, we have migrant workers, but they're all healthy. Now, for every, for we've, we've got about, in Singapore, about a million low-wage workers, from uh, construction workers to domestic helpers to people in uh, food and beverage, right? Now, within this cohort, there will be people who have got chronic disease and regular uh, problems. Now, so, in the past, the coverage for them was only if you are admitted to hospital, tertiary care, primary health care, no insurance. So what happens? The, the employers are supposed to be paying for the primary care for the, uh, the, the GP services of the workers. But you know, it's not easy, right? If you have a large company and all that. So many of the uh, workers went without. Now today, the government now has got this covered. Every worker now is covered with primary health care insurance, which is fantastic. How did it happen? Well, it was education, awareness, and then a will to want to change. And that came through all levels, at the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Manpower, but also civil society, seeing the plight of the migrant worker who was without a good health care system or primary health care system. So I think we need the whole of society to actually tackle a problem of access to healthcare, in this case, migrant workers who are vulnerable. And I think the same will apply for all uh, around the world, right? We need a whole society to come. Thank you, Dr. Go. Um, SK, do you have anything to add on this area? Because I know that you've worked with many different countries in different areas and um, would, would, do you have some uh, experience working, I, I wouldn't call it migrant workers, but your primary health care um, experience in those areas or your policy um, work in those areas? Thank you. Uh, no, I don't have direct experience working in healthcare with migrant workers. I think it's more right. Dr. Goss field. Um, however, uh, can I broaden the definition of migrant workers so also include other categories with, with whom I have some experience? So migrant workers could be regular or documented migrant workers or Singapore's finds it easy to control the entry of uh, people into Singapore, which is uh, uh, good. However, other countries like Malaysia find it a bit difficult to control the um, inflow of uh, um, people to come in. So there's a second group, undocumented migrants or irregular migrants. Either they 
come in uh, without permission or they overstay their permission. That's the second group. The third group will be refugees. And the fourth group will be stateless people. They have no citizenship. Now, this entire set, right? Regular migrants or documented, undocumented or irregular. Thirdly, refugees. Fourthly, stateless. Each of them have got their own specific problems and challenges. Um, Singapore's, if I may use the word, quite lucky uh, because you're able to control, we are able to control immigration. Other countries are less lucky. Uh, they may have a formal refugee policy or not have a formal refugee policy. Sometimes it will be very hostile against refugees. I worked with refugees for six years. Uh, this was 2003 to eight uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and at that time, Malaysia's policy was quite hostile uh, against refugees. Um, and today is less hostile, but still not as welcoming. Now, the world doesn't have a, um, e there's no easy solution to refugees. I'm not going to come and say to all of us that, ah, oh, snap your finger, refugee problem will go away. Climate change is coming, so there'll be more climate refugees, mm. something else for us to consider. Uh, what are our duties to them? What are states or government's duties to them? All, all those are very complex questions, which I think will be very difficult to answer. We need a separate dialogue by the Hate Foundation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, SQ, for your response. Um, we have a question there. Sorry, I, I, cut, I cut in first. I raised my hand just now. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm actually a, a, a professional in healthcare uh, on the diagnostic side of things. Uh, I, I love your comments about um, the emphasis on hospital care, uh, uh, lack of emphasis on primary care, and perhaps it's a perception uh, or a comment, right, that, uh, I mean, healthcare as we see, as we experience today is a fairly recent invention in society, right, it's about 100, 100 years old, right, uh, modern medicine is about 70, 80 years old, I mean, antibiotics were invented in World War One, right, uh, World War One, World War Two, and I guess because of the nature, relatively recent nature of healthcare conditions, diseases, problems tend to get exacerbated or progressed to a point where it's extremely complex and requires specialist expertise to effectively intervene and handle, right? Not everyone can go in and do a heart bypass, right? Because we didn't figure out how to prevent this until they turn up with a heart attack. But now with increasing understanding um, and, and, and increasing tools, right, or from an intervention perspective that really thinks about how we can, or, or potentially can help us think about preventive care um, as physicians um, and participants within this ecosystem. How do you see the training of healthcare professionals and the connectivity between primary care and hospital care changing in order to move this shift towards intervening early as opposed to heart attack, do time to do bypass. Yeah. yeah, so the shift really, or to bridge this gap, as you mentioned, uh, Andrew, right, your name? Yeah, it's really shifting from hospital base to the community. So care has been moved to the community and the responsibility. And that's what this whole, uh, I think in the last few years, you have seen that shift. And therefore, the role of the primary care physician in the community is key. It's almost that bridge between the two. So, I, and again, the training and, and um, the funding and resourcing has to come in. And the support services, again, it requires not just doctors and nurses, but the whole suite of uh, services. And just to, talk, uh, the, to, to complete that, you again need civil society, you need NGO groups, you need uh, volunteers to come in to add another dimension, which is often missed out in a very highly specialized formal uh, network that I talked about, right? So I think, yes, we need to move the emphasis from hospital care just down to the community. So community is key. And many countries that have got uh, uh, emphasis on, say, community care first, I think do much better, right? Because if you have the, all the resources, just plugged into high level tertiary care, then the prevention is not there. So prevention is key in this, yeah. Education, prevention, which is happening now, I think. Uh, your move is towards that very clearly, especially when we're talking about healthy SG, one, uh, one doctor, you know, one GP for yeah, one, one person, yeah. Thanks, Thanks Um 
Thank you for the question, Andrew. I'm going to make it question even even the problem even worse um, by saying that medical education and healthcare education is five years behind the times. X number of years. Five is just a number. Here's what I mean. So um, textbooks today, for example, a medical textbook, medical student, I'm 20 years old or 18 years old in Singapore, I go into National University of Singapore, I'm using a textbook that was written one year ago. So one year ago is when the technology was current then. And then when the time you graduate, you will you remember the textbook from five years ago, and then you go off to work. And if you don't continually upskill yourself, then you're five years, then 10 years, then 15 years, and 30 years behind the signs. Um, COVID, uh, during COVID, Mr. Liang, just for fun, right? Uh, there are something like uh, 2 million papers, academic papers published about COVID during COVID itself, uh, four years, you know, 2 million papers in four years time. I, I didn't, I cannot possibly read all of them. So that kind of inflow of information and the outdatedness of medical education, right? It's a whole world problem, yeah? So it's not centralized to any one country, um, makes medical education uh, difficult. And if the millennials like TikTok, then we have to train them using TikTok. Instead of a textbook that's 50 pages or 5,000 pages, then we're going to train them during a five minute video or even 30 seconds video on TikTok. So that's one thing to, um, to, to you know, exacerbate the problem. There's one small solution though. Um, I, I believe that financial incentives, and sorry to talk about money all the time, um, financial incentives are important. There's a reason why uh, doctors, when if given a choice of specialization, I will choose ophthalmology, example, because I make a lot of money in ophthalmology, plastic surgery, ophthalmology, aesthetic medicine. There are certain disciplines, uh, look, public information, Google, salary, specialists, and you, you kind of get a sense of how much specialists will get. Because of that financial incentive, which is very predictable, it's a human condition. If family physicians are paid more or equal to a specialist in a hospital, then more people will do family medicine. Then there'll be better primary care and cascades onto the whole system. So financial incentives are quite important, like it or not, uh, in, in deciding how to allocate talent and, and how to improve systems around the world. Andrew, thank you for your question. Thank you. It seems like it's best that we have an MOH person here listening to this so that we can move this <laughs> towards this direction. But actually, as a follow on on that, wouldn't, would you think that if we are paying um, our family physicians more, would that also bring up the cost of primary health care? And then is that where the government is to come in to subsidize? I guess we'd like to hear your views on that as well. Okay, as a family physician, I think the balance is important. Right? I think uh, we need to see ourselves as players in the ecosystem, the larger ecosystem. I think there's a need for specialists, but and also primary healthcare uh, physicians, all in the same we're in the same ecosystem. And you have if you trade too many of one, that upsets the whole ecosystem. Right? So I think we cannot. Uh, so uh, in terms of healthcare uh, economics and all that, I think it's a very fine balance, right, isn't right. it? Uh, let's say you do capitation or you do subvention in terms of payment, then there are certain trade-offs. If you say fee for you know service, certain trade-offs as you mentioned earlier. So I think if you are yeah. uh, cognizant of all of this, I think then we're always balancing. I think we have to be agile, and things will change, right? The COVID comes, we have to change. We have to do tech, right? Like uh, telemedicine, for example. Right. Suddenly, uh, with the migrant workers, for example, when COVID came, we did telemedicine. Right. And uh, so things change. So I think for us to do well in the years to come, agility is probably key. Right? Changing all the time. And, and I think most likely the change will be shifting towards, again, primary care. Mm. Right. Thank you. I think we had a question just now with the gentleman over there. Uh, especially on this VUCA world where it's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, yeah. going forward, how do you see the role of primary uh, health care evolving and innovating uh, going forward because we have seen so many disruptions we have seen chaos and uncertainties and diseases coming right here instantly and upfront so i'm just curious about how how do the role of this primary health care evolve over the course of years so any foresight and insight or a vision as you may say thank you well, sure. I'll go you, you go first. Yeah. thank you can I make that even more complicated and put in climate change and sustainability as well? So, uh, the, uh, your name, sir, again? Chang. 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 Thank you. Um, so, your question is what? Some, he used an acronym called VUCA, VUCA. VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. It's an invented term that comes from the US, probably. Um, 
So the, the term VUCA uh, is used to describe the world today because very vol the world is very volatile, everything changes all the time, it's very uncertain, it's very complex because what happens, uh, for example, in Ukraine uh, uh, affects uh, people in Southeast Asia and it's very ambiguous as in we don't have enough information or all the information in order to make a decision. To add on to that and the role of primary care in the VUCA, V-U-C-A world is to say that climate change and sustainability are also important, meaning I've just complicated the problem even more, right? Um, so how do we uncomplicate that? Uh, I, I don't have a perfect solution. Let me give one part of the solution because for complex systems and complex problems, we need complex solutions. So multi, uh, a problem like climate change has got multiple causes. And for multiple causes, we need multiple solutions for the cause. So for primary care, one thing that we can consider doing is how can primary care um, be the... Um, Let's call it the foundation or the cornerstone or the most important part, fundamental part of a, of a healthcare system. Meaning during COVID, uh, lots of primary care clinics were delivering vaccinations. That's one example of how primary care can be the cornerstone of a system. Primary care in the UK, uh, in the National Health Service in the UK, is acting as a gatekeeper function. Meaning you want to see a specialist in an NHS hospital, you have to go through primary care first. And primary care in uh, the UK right, are all specialists. Because you don't just finish medical school, you become a GP, you finish medical school, then you have to take a, a certification program to become a specialist GP. So GPs are making sure that uh, if you really need to see a specialist, you see a specialist. If you don't need to see a specialist, uh, you, uh, you can be managed at the, at the primary care level. So the second example of how primary care can act as a gatekeeper function, also as a cornerstone of the health system. Any health system needs to be resilient. Um, there are many definitions of resilience. Um, one definition of resilience that's helpful to know, to know is that if there is a problem, the system can respond quickly. Usually, um, the resilience of a health system can be measured in the strength and the resilience of primary care. There's some academic papers over there as well. And maybe I'll pause my answer over there, having um, made your question a lot more complicated. Thank you very much for your question. Excellent one. Yeah, thanks. So this is a really good question because you know primary care in the future will be the mainstay, right? It will be the foundation, as you mentioned. And in the Singapore context, during COVID, all the family uh, uh, medicine clinics were activated. Almost all, I would say, most of them uh, responded. And I think that's quite telling. And I think a lot of that was because of support. There was uh, support resources. For example, the government will provide us with gowns and with all the consumables and then also with access to test kits and there was daily uh, education or daily uh, updates in terms of protocols and what to do. So there must be a deliberate intentional uh, effort uh, uh, on the part of the authorities or in this case MOH for example coming in. Now you take that further, primary care again involves the entire ecosystem not just the Ministry of Health, you have, you have got schools, you have got the uh, Ministry of uh, Social and Family, right? You have, you have uh, so everyone coming in and social workers and what, you know, if someone has got no money, he can't get a meal, that will happen. So, and everything has got to do with health and therefore healthcare is part of this. So I think we have to see, not work in silos for primary care to be, successful, it cannot be a silo. Mm. All the other components must come in. Equal emphasis, we got to think ecosystem. If you're thinking I, silos, so if MOH is not talking to MOM, it's not talking to MSF and all, we're in trouble. And I think in COVID that taught us a big lesson that we all the ministries have to talk together. So that will then be able to connect uh, rather uh, the, all the disparate uh, agencies. Can I add one thought over there to say, um, I agree with what Dr. Goh has mentioned. Um, to be clear, primary care is as important as other parts of the system. Every part of the system is important. We cannot say one part is more important than the other yeah. because they're often very interdependent. I think for Dr. Gore and I, we believe in the power of primary care. This is true. As a personal opinion, I think that primary care can be a little bit more higher stature and elevated. Also true as an opinion. Um, and this is to say that uh, all parts of the system are so interdependent and therefore so important uh, that we cannot ignore any one part of the system. So I think we're not here to say that other parts of the system are not important. Mm -hmm. We're here to say that all parts of the system are important. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman there. Um, thank you both. Wonderful um, lecture. My question is, um, 
is there a role below the uh, general practitioner doctor for something like a prescription nurse so that you know you relieve the work that a gp does you know i'm sure there's a, a lot of cases that can be handled by a prescription nurse or somebody uh, at a, that doesn't require so much medical school so that it will actually help lower the cost and also improve access yeah, so in the Singapore system, we've got nurse practitioners, for example, in hospitals, right? So that's a part of the whole ecosystem already. And in other countries too, yes, uh, I know a friend of mine who, who was in China, he did one village doctor training, for example, that trained people without, uh, you know, trained more than nurses, right? They, or people lower than nurses, but they were able to do village doctor, simple doctor training. But over here in Singapore, we have got, uh, again, you know, higher levels, so to speak, Training, so I think it's about training and moving up. But I think it's the interdependence. I don't think we can say again, uh, having you know uh, more doctors will solve the problem or more nurses doing prescribing. It's just this interdependence, uh, the different roles. Yes, I agree with you. I think there is a possibility or role for expanding this. So I think we got to identify where the gaps are in terms of the labor. Uh, or the, the, the crunch, labor crunch, or where the gap is in terms of special uh, providing the services. Like nurses is big, you know, there's a yeah, shortage or dearth of nurses around the world, globally. And they're being poached, uh, pretty move from country to country, right? There's a problem. Yeah. Now, having a Filipino nurse here or a nurse from China or from Myanmar will also deprive their home country. What do we do? We live in the world. We cannot just think of ourselves, for example, right? And that is a problem. But how do we balance this? How does this move around? Uh, it's a big question. <laughs> no answers for that. Right? Sure. Actually, uh, actually, I uh, resonate with it also, resonating with me. I recall some years ago when I was in India. <laughs> uh, when I was in India, you know, I was staying with a friend and he said, you know, no, you don't have to go and see a doctor because a doctor you spend half the day, you know. And, uh, you know, just go down to the pharmacy and explain your symptoms yeah. and you get the prescription and it's very good. And true enough, you know, I, I was able to get the medicine and uh, I didn't have to go and see any doctor. And I think maybe something similar can also happen in Singapore, but I'm not sure about uh, who's going to pay for it, yeah. uh, whether insurance or whether your employer will pay for it. So I think that part. In, in the Singapore context, maybe that can be expanded because we have a lot of pharmacies and I think they have, they might, I'm sure they have studied many years and they have experience so far simple things, you know, uh, some uh, not anything life threatening or some uh, minor ailment or even a, you just knock uh, when, while walking you knock and you need some medicine, you can just go to the pharmacy and get it, but it should be paid for, you know, because if you go to a doctor or you plow up for a polyclinic, you spend up, you spend half the day, you know. Exactly. So I think if you want to make the yeah. primary healthcare efficient, I think this is one way, you know, to expand. Absolutely, absolutely. You go to pharmacies and Doctor Google does wonders. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's check with Doctor Google. Yeah, it's a good point. SK, you were going to say something. Um, I wanted to respond to an excellent question by Mister. Lester. Thank you, Lester. If I may. Um, let me introduce, if I may, two uh, concepts. The first concept is called community health worker. The second concept is called task shifting. Uh, in a relatively small country like uh, Singapore, I mean, physically small, uh, like Singapore, you don't have access issues. It, clinics are quite easy to get to. But for a large, sprawling country, think of Mongolia, think of uh, Saudi Arabia, large countries, right, uh, where, where it's difficult to get access, physical access to a health professional, we can consider a community health worker. There are uh, there, there is this beautiful, uh, I'm not sure if it's a documentary, but certainly a lot of stories have been told about the barefoot doctor in Kenya. Enough health training, like uh, uh, not as much five years as a medical training, uh, but enough training for the barefoot doctor as a community health worker to go to rural parts of Kenya and then to serve the people in Kenya. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely agree with you. I offer no judgment or opinion about uh, should it be implemented in one country or another. I'm just giving an example of how community health workers exist in certain countries, example in Kenya. The second example is something called task shifting, meaning if it doesn't need to be done by a specialist, let it be done by a junior doctor. If it doesn't need to be done by a doctor, let it be done by a nurse. If it doesn't need to be done by a nurse, let it be done by a community health worker. We continue shifting tasks. 
when you shift task, you're making yourselves more efficient. And uh, when there are so few nurses and so few doctors, you shift tasks appropriately, including to the patient, huh? because the patient cannot only like wait there and wait for other people to serve the patient. The point is that shifting tasks from uh, to the appropriate level of seniority will help increase access and improve the user experience and reduce costs as well, to your point. I again offer no judgment about whether or not pharmacists should prescribe, nurses should prescribe, or only doctors should prescribe. This is a matter best left to the individual countries uh, for them to decide what's best according to their situation at that point in time. And often there are lobby groups. Uh, sometimes pharmacists want to prescribe, sometimes pharmacists don't. Sometimes doctors say yes, sometimes doctors say no. And all these things are best uh, left to at the country level uh, and I offer no opinion over that. Thank you for your question, Esther. Thank you. Um, if I may take a time to just pause to some of the questions online then we get back to both our questions. Yeah, so um, let's see. There was a question that was really in line with actually my own question, which is, um, with, with um, technology actually advancing, you know, AI, um, even, um, what's that, AR, augmented reality, how do you see that um, actually playing a role in the future of um, primary care? And uh, do you see that actually helping in terms of affordability, accessibility to your patients? Um, how, do you see, how do you see that um, playing a role in the future? You're right into this. <laughs> um, You're doing this. Thank you. The question is, Will AI uh, make healthcare better or make healthcare worse? More equitable, better access, or less equitable, less access? I don't know. It can either go that way or this way, as it's really good or not so good. The really good part is uh, with AI, with digital, with virtual, if we do it correctly and we do it regul and we regulate it well, uh, when I say we, I mean governments, uh, professional societies, codes of conduct, consumer associations, patient groups, uh, if, if all these organizations uh, do well and encourage companies to go in the right direction, then we'll be uh, in a good space. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, digital technology will improve access. But if done poorly, it can also reduce access. Only the rich people have it, which is not good. Or even middle class have it, but not the lower classes of society, shall we say. Um, those who are literate have it, not so literate, don't have it. Those who have smartphones have it as in digital healthcare, but no smartphones, no digital healthcare. You have 5G, you get digital healthcare. You don't have 5G, you don't get digital healthcare. These are um, things which are not technology driven, uh, as in technology is there. Technology can be considered neutral. It's what human beings, societies, governments do with that technology that determine whether or not the technology will be useful or not so useful. Um, I'm asked to make a prediction. I can't make a prediction, yeah. So we came head on with uh, technology during COVID. And I think very quickly, we, the doctors, for example, we then had to come with protocols and uh, regulations. So the Ministry of Health, for example, started to do training for doctors who are interested in doing, for example, telemedicine, which was uh, first introduced, or at least on a larger nationwide scale. And uh, so interestingly, in, when they were serving the migrant workers, because in the migrant workers scene, the dormitories are all in lockdown, right? And the only way you could reach them was telemedicine. So uh, I remember I, I was doing the first telemedicine clinic for HealthServe and I had to have a, I had a final year student help me with it and we did a hybrid of sorts. Because what happened was I was at home and this medical student was in the HealthServe clinic but at that time it was open but very few patients. We, and so she was then doing some examination for me while I was giving instructions and you know, uh, working with her. And with that, we then developed, and then there was other players who had tried some telemedicine uh, project with us. And so COVID really pushed us to do it. Yeah, I think, it, again, it's contextual, but I think the regulations and all that have to come in tandem with it. Yeah. Good example. Okay, can we go? Yes. Hi, uh, just a question about the political will. Um, so for that to succeed, I just want to know whether the relationship with the GPs and the doctors, how can that be enhanced for healthy SG? And the second question is um, like the seniors, seniors, the elderly, uh, they could have some issues using apps or mobile phone. So in order for them to download the app or to share information, uh, probably their children or their caregivers 
could also come into the picture so that uh, they can collaborate with yeah, the necessarily uh, where do you see there are areas or some right. gaps that can be improved? Okay, sure. Maybe I can take that. So for the first, uh, your first question, I think for healthy SG, where we want that, and you know everyone to be involved. So there have been many conversations, lots of dialogues. In fact, every day I have to attend. Uh, there's a webinar to attend. There's a you know a continual medical education, and the ministers MOH engages us all the time. Not only that, the engagement is also with other people in this healthy SG. Uh, again, the uh, community services, uh, other people involved, the uh, social workers, healthcare providers, right? So, and the IT people, uh, national uh, electronic uh, healthcare records and all that. So, we have got IT, we've got medicine, we've got social work. So, again, it shows that you need the whole of society to be involved in if this was to succeed. And I think we're making good progress in terms of the political will because. It's quite strong and you know we're working but of course uh, it's new so there's a lot of work everything's new and i think we need to be able to live with a bit of mess as, as it starts uh, if we want a perfect system i don't think we're we'll we'll about to get there uh, and your second question was about uh, yeah that, okay so i i run a gp practice in chinatown and i've got patients who are uh, you know in the 80s and 90s even right and so you mentioned something interesting that children and maybe their neighbors will have come in. So again, while we have technology, we have all the systems, we really need a human touch. I think the moment you lose that, it's going to be cold and soulless and it'll never be really working. We may cure the person, right? Or maybe we uh, 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 alleviate the, the, the physical symptoms, but you know the soul will be missing, right? Uh, I think the, the care, the real, the real care. So I think for the older folks, in, for example, in my constituency, many of them will actually will still need the analog or a, a physical space. And that's why we have GP services or polyclinics throughout the island. Access to healthcare is important. Now, of course, we're lucky because Singapore is such a small space. We are all, you know, not more than half an hour, 15 minutes from a nearest GP. So I think that's uh, access is not really a problem. Yeah. So with people helping, of course, if they are able to do that. So I think as the years go by, the next generation will be less of a problem, right? Now with the aging population, the aging population will also be more and more educated in terms of technology. They will be more comfortable with it. So I, don't, I think this problem will be less and less. But for now, we really have to go all out to uh, render assistance and help or neighbors who are much older. Thank you, Dr. Go. How about that lady over there? Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanne. Uh, thank you for a very enlightening talk. Um, Dr. Go, I was very um, taken by your phrase, uh, the power of informal networks. And I know that GPs are very busy people. Um, so could you share your experience in how you grow the informal network and how, as uh, we move more into healthier SG, um, how do we also encourage the growth of this informal network? And how can we help? Thanks. Well, so the word informal networks really means friendship. It's about having meals around the table. It is about treating every client, patient, as your friend, as a fellow human being. I think that's key. Without that core identity as a fellow human, then we'll be treating everyone transactional. So I think we, uh, for informal networks to happen, to be, to be strong, the uh, relational framework has to be there versus the transactional. I have a strong network, but usually formal networks are much more transactional in its framework. So informal will be more relational. And uh, for example, I have uh, each day I'll get, you know, chai tau kuei or chi kuei uh, from my patients, right? And sometimes when I go uh, visit them or I go to the hawker centre, I get a fee meal, they, ins you know, they insist on me not paying. Uh, I attend their weddings, I attend their, you know, uh, they'll come to me for different things. And again, it's because of that relationship. So I think informal networks takes time, 
takes effort, but it has a lot of benefit. So I think informal networks. So I think Singapore, we are generally quite transactional because we are efficient. But if you're talking about efficacy, right, then sometimes, you know, relationships got to come in. It's a very important point yeah, that you brought out there. I think that's what really makes um, community works, actually. Otherwise, it's all very transactional and all that. So in the interest of time, actually, we're going to close the session. Do, is there any last questions we have from the audience that you might want to ask? No? OK. So with that, I would like to thank both our speakers for today. Thank you for your very insightful sharing. I think what I really got out of it was that healthcare in general is just complex many balancing acts to to make um there's no one perfect solution but i thank the audience today as well for all your inputs i think even from the audience you're already hearing you no know, ideas of how we can build networks how we can improve healthcare and so i hope that this has been a great um dialogue for everyone and so with that we just uh, close and thank both our speakers again